We've got an earnings bonanza, and when the Secretary of Energy speaks, Joel listens. Let's go digging for value. I'm Allison Southwick, and I'm joined today by Taylor Muckerman and Joel South, energy analyst here at The Motley Fool. Like I said, we've got a lot of earnings to cover, lots, covered, yeah. lots to cover, but we're going to start off with just some headlines. So first up, typically in the U.S., mm -hmm or historically, the number of rigs has been used as a kind of predictor or a gauge for natural gas right. production. But today, we've heard from the EIA that rig count isn't a good indicator. So, Taylor, what did you think about this? Well, this is something we've been thinking about for a long time. Um, but now the EIA is coming out with a little bit more data to support it. And uh, basically, you see less and less natural gas rigs out there actually specifically going after natural gas. But natural gas is still rising on a production level. And that's because of two things. One is that wells are producing both oil and natural gas at an increasing rate. And two, I think one of the most important factors is that you see an increase in pad drilling, which is uh, service providers going out there and drilling more wells at the same site. And so it takes less time to do it. And that only requires one rig. What they do is they have these rigs on tracks. So only moving them 40 to 50 feet either side, back or forward, and they get you know anywhere up to 12 or, or more wells per pad, they call it. So that's one of the reasons why you see less rigs out there, but the well count is still increasing. So then what do you use as a gauge? Well, basically, you know, I look at a quarterly basis. You can look at a bunch of companies' transcripts talking about how much more they are using pad drilling, and services companies are a great place to look because they're the ones actually doing the drilling. Halliburton talks about uh, their COO, Jeff Miller, talked about this third quarter. 50% of their North American customers are using pad drilling, and they see that increasing even further as the year and next year continues on. And then Schlumberger is actively working on technology to refrack wells that are underproducing. So they're going back, same well, no risk needed, they're just going back to refrack it. So it's going to start producing a little bit more, leads to higher production. And Kodiak Oil and Gas, I talked about upwards of 12 wells per rig or per pad, and they're actually working on that in the Bakken earlier this year, and they've seen great success from it. So uh, more, pet, more, more wells per pad leads to higher production, but less rigs. Mm -hmm. All right, moving on. Oil and Gas Journal is reporting on the comments made by U.S. Secretary of Energy Ernest Moniz. I'll paraphrase here because that's always sure. a good idea. Uh, basically, it's great that we're reducing our oil dependence on other countries, but don't hang that mission accomplished banner just yet. So Joel, what do you think about the whole idea of energy independence for our country? Well, I think it's interesting that this is still a focus. Basically in 1973 with the oil embargo, everybody was worried about the amount of oil that we are importing. So that's basically been the psyche of the energy policy mm -hmm. since then. It seems like it's still there and it really shouldn't be. If you look at the amount of oil that we're actually importing, especially say from Saudi Arabia, which is now under 15%, it really is not that important. And regardless of where we get it, say the Middle East, or if we're getting it from the Permian Basin in the United States, we're still going to be paying the same amount, uh, basically because it's a, it's a global price. So it doesn't matter where we're getting it from. What you need to focus on uh, basically is OPEC is out there. They're going to uh, restrict or add supply and really gauge the prices. So that shouldn't be a worry. You shouldn't be focusing on that as a policy. It's pretty much just uh, political rhetoric at this time, and we shouldn't. It shouldn't be uh, something to focus on. So he also talked about infrastructure concerns, specifically vulnerabilities due to weather, terrorism, and then he also questioned the ability of our pipeline mm -hmm. to effectively handle the volume. Mm -hmm. What did you think about that? I think that's really where the focus should be. The infrastructure, especially the pipeline infrastructure, needs to be added. It's really in short supply, and it's affecting a number of businesses. And if you look at it, you know, if you look at Trans Canada's uh, Keystone XL pipeline, which is you know a pretty contentious issue right now, this could really open up a lot of oil that we're needing. So if you're looking at in energy independence, it's not going to be United States energy independence. It's going to be North American. So if you're look, if you that's really the focus. The Keystone Pipeline should be one of the big areas where you're getting so much oil from the oil sands. And there's also talk now that they could even plug in from the Bakken in North Dakota place into that pipeline to get it down to the Gulf Coast. So that's very huge. On top of that, you need natural gas and natural gas liquids pipeline. There's a lot of talk of being a new manufacturing base in the United States, bring a lot of jobs back because of cheap natural gas. We really need the pipeline to expand that business and also to be the world leaders in chemical and fertilizers. A lot of the natural gas liquids pipelines need to be built out. So we're in short supply. That should be the focus, and that will really help uh, dictate where the policy should be and where we're going in the future. You talk about the Bakken and the Keystone XL pipeline, which seems to be the song that never ends. Continental Resources CEO um, 
Ham, he came out and said, you know, maybe you should try putting more North America or U.S. oil in your pipeline. Maybe then the United States will be a little bit more favorable in terms of allowing that pipeline coming through. And he's one of the biggest uh, oil producers in the Bakken. So mm -hmm. helps him out a little bit, but it might help TransCanada as well if they go that route. All right, let's move on. Financial Times is reporting that Consol Energy is selling a third of its coal business for about $3.5 billion. That's a lot of the, money. It is a lot of money. The reason is they're saying they're not seeing a lot of growth domestically for coal-fired power and that they're going to focus on natural gas. So if they're getting out of coal because they don't see the growth, who would want to buy it? Like, why? Murray Energy bought it. Why are they buying it? Uh, I mean, I guess they're a coal specialist. They're not really uh, relying on, uh, or they don't have to kind of prove things to their investors since they're not publicly traded. So maybe that's why they believe that they can get away with these assets over a little bit longer time horizon. Uh, Consol has been a coal company since the 1860s, so they're really starting to change their focus over the last few years, um, getting into coal bed methane uh, production as well as Marcellus natural gas production. So um, really changing the ideological shift of this company. Uh, investors liked it yesterday. They didn't seem to like it so much today. Um, maybe because they have the dividend, but they believe that that puts them more aligned with natural gas peers um, because it is such a high growth industry right now. They're going to have more money to spend on, on the growth that they expect to see 30% uh, natural gas growth in 2015 and 2016. So um, I'm not too sure why Murray wants, this, wants these resources you see uh, Central Appalachian coal a lot more expensive than its peers in Illinois Basin and the Powder River Basin. So uh, you just have to scratch your head why they want it, but at least investors in that company um, can't sell their shares as readily as they can in a, in a publicly traded coal company. Right. So when you see companies like Consul saying we're getting, we're, we're not getting out completely, no, but right. we're we're moving away from coal, is this a general bellwether to you about the future of coal? I don't want to say the death of coal, but, mm -hmm. but what do you think when you see that kind of talk? Um, well, I think with Consul in particular, I mentioned the price discrepancies of cost of producing it in the Appalachian region versus other basins. And you're seeing the Central App region really take the brunt of the, of the market uh, unfolding lower prices to sell it and higher cost to produce it. Um, so you're seeing companies like Arch Coal moving their thermal production to the Powder River Basin, which is the cheapest. They say it's about a sixth of the price to produce versus Central Appalachian Coal. So you're seeing them move away and rely more on met, uh, the Appalachian region for metallurgical coal and steel production. So you're seeing kind of a paradigm shift in where they're producing it. Domestic coal is always going to be produced in my mind. I don't think there's a death of coal, just maybe uh, a slowdown at regionally for where you're seeing coal being produced. All right, well, let's move on to our last headline of the day. We're going to take a look at how the Brent WTI spread is doing. It's widening. Why? Well, that's very interesting. <laughs> uh, what's really going on, the Brent price is the international price, and you're seeing some production issues out of Libya, which is increasing the price globally. However, that's not really translating into the United States because we're still sitting on a lot of stockpiles. So you're seeing that margin widen, mm -hmm. which is good news for refiners because we have access now to some cheaper feedstocks. So that's always good news. All right, then what's your advice for investors here? Well, for investors, I think you have to look at a number of companies that have access to this cheap, uh, this cheap crude. And first off, you saw Valero's earnings today, and they're a company that does have access here. And they said, looking at the third quarter when the prices were close, I mean, if you look at 2012, when almost all the refiners in the United States gained 50 to 100 percent, the price was the, tr the difference between the WTI and Brent price was upwards of 20 to 25 dollars. Um, it actually narrowed down and was basically flat over the third quarter. And you saw a lot of companies or investors sell out of these companies. So a company like Valero said that looking forward, they're looking at uh, with the widening, they're already seeing margins starting to increase. So I would look for companies like that or a company like uh, Holly Frontier that has a lot of mid-con uh, um, refiners where they have access close to a lot of the, the, the plays where you can get that light, sweet crude. And then companies like Tesoro where they have a lot of uh, pipelines or uh, they have pipelines and rain uh, trail sorry, rail, that brings a lot of the oil straight to the refiners. So they're the companies that really can benefit. And if you see that $10 spread, that's a huge benefit for those companies. And if it keeps expanding, if more issues happen in Libya or some of the other uh, big producing uh, countries like Iraq, you see that Brent price climb up. The stockpiles here in the United States are still gaining. So that's good news for refiners as that, uh, that price differential expands. Agreed. All right, let's move on from the headlines because as we promised, we have a lot of earnings to cover. Absolutely. So the first companies we're going to take a look at, we're going to have um, a couple little Goldilockses here who are going to look at a couple companies and you guys are going to tell me whether the market reaction was too hot, too cold or just right. Okay. So first company we're going to look at, uh, Taylor, is for you. Mead West Vaco saw a 9% uh, drop, more than 9% drop today. Day, yeah. um, after announcing earnings that they announced last night, 
What did we learn from their earnings, and did you think the market reaction was too hot, too cold, or just right? Well, investors had time to sleep on it, and I think they woke up a little cranky because they're down 9%, which I think is a little overheated. Um, they had a 57% boost in third quarter re or profits, so um, that did miss estimates slightly, but a 57% boost you wouldn't think would lead to a 9% decline uh, in the stock market. Um, they saw great pr production out of their industrial segments, producing packaging for industrial uh, reasons, but their consumer lines like health and beauty and food and beverage kind of saw a little pullback this quarter, so um, maybe that's why, but I don't think it's worth 9%, especially when you see companies like International Paper talk about um, companies as big as McDonald's and Dunkin' Donuts moving away from styrofoam cups in 2015 and 2016. So that's a good tailwind for a lot of these packaging companies. Um, so I think the food and beverage might pick up a little bit for this company. Um, Otherwise, I'm not too sure, other than the fact that they had a deal to sell some timberland to Plum Creek Timber um, in the southwest and eastern seaboard. So maybe that's why I, don't, I didn't see a valuation on these assets as to, to compare to the $1.1 billion price tag that they garnered for it. Um, maybe that's why they're down so much, because it is a hard asset and timber is constantly replenishing. So that's the only reason why I could see it down 9%, but I still think that's overheated. All right, Joel. For you, BP also announced earnings um, this morning. Yes. And they are up about 4% today. What did we learn and what did you think of the reaction? So I thought the reaction was pretty fair. Uh, what they did is their um, adjusted profits came in higher than they were expected, obviously significantly down from year over year. A lot of that is because they sold off so many assets. So they came in at a profit of $3.7 billion. Analysts were expecting it to be $3.4 billion. So I really like what they're doing overall. Obviously that's a good quarter, but they're really setting themselves up nice for the future. And you know, since Macondo, they've sold off about $66 billion in assets. So obviously they're really shrinking their size so they can pay off a lot of that litigation costs. And by doing that, they're focusing now on more plays that have higher ROI. So they're really looking at the best plays offshore and they're also building out a lot of natural gas uh, value chains. So it's, they're really focusing on, on solid plays. And I like that because they're now an integrated company that has growth potential, which you don't see. And they already have a pretty solid dividend. They increased the dividend by nine cents. So they're you know about 5% yield. If you compare that to an Exxon or a Chevron that are still, uh, Exxon I think is 2.7, Chevron's 3.3. Uh, they're significantly better yield and they have that growth, which I think is so important. Right. So that's what I really like this, about this company. They also announced that they're gonna have another $10 billion dollar in asset sales completed in the next two years. They're looking at that 10 billion and really earmarking it to return it to shareholders basically in the form of buybacks. So obviously that's nice. A lot of shareholders of BP have been clamoring for more dividend increases. I think by keeping the cash internally and then selling more dividends to return to them is the best way to go because they need that money to really fund that expensive, you know, $24 billion capital expenditures for the next uh, three or four years. So I really like that. Uh, obviously the worry here is the litigation charges. You, we're still seeing this uh, phase two and three probably be completed next year. They're looking like that will be about a billion dollars more than they were previously expecting, but that's not too bad considering what it could have been. So I really think having that growth and that nice dividend uh, deserves that 4%. But. All right, so we got a just right reaction for BP and too, too, too hot, hot too for too hot. Reed West Baco. All right, well, let's move on and let's put some sectors under the microscope okay. here to see um, if we're seeing any sort of common denominators or common reactions or common results, I guess, so mm -hmm. to speak. So, Taylor, you looked at some specialty chemical companies right. that reported. What are you seeing? I'm seeing some trends uh, among the winners and, uh, and one of the losers, uh, especially today, you saw a few report and some good earnings, some not so good. Uh, the winners I've seen so far uh, include Eco Labs, DuPont, and Huntsman. The uh, theme with these three has been uh, acquisitions and spinoffs. You saw um, Eco Labs acquire Champion, so they moved a little bit more heavily into the energy space. They saw great growth. They're looking for 18 to 19 percent growth in full year EPS. Uh, as, a, as a whole. So this company is doing very well, rolling these companies in at a very uh, in efficient clip. And then you look at Huntsman also acquiring uh, some businesses. They acquired a TI, a titanium dioxide TiO2 uh, segment from Rockwood Holdings. They're looking to take that, combine it with their existing business, spin that off to shareholders, as it has been an underproducing uh, line of business. And the same thing with DuPont. They, they didn't spin it off yet, but they brought up the idea of spinning off and then announced that they're going to, much to shareholders' delight because it has been pulling back on some of their segments that have been doing really well, like uh, safety and electronics involving Kevlar and solar panels. So 
Look at those three companies being winners. Lionel Basel released earnings today. Not so great. They're down uh, refining. They're a little bit different of a chemical company. They produce uh, some feedstocks into the chemical companies, so they they really hurt by refining margins and also renewable uh, identification uh, units uh, as far as like. Uh, renewable energy, ethanol, things like that. So um, they were hurt by that and, and higher gasoline inventories as well. So um, the theme is uh, mergers and acquisitions and spinoffs right there for the three winners. All right. So, Joel, you looked at natural gas producers. Mm -hmm. What are you seeing? So it's, I was looking at some of the low-cost producers that announced last week and earlier this week. And what I'm seeing is more production that we saw in the first quarter and second quarter that's continuing to hold over. And you're also looking at production or expenses really being lowered. So the two companies I was looking at is Cabot Oil and Gas and EQT Corp. And basically, if you look at the production numbers, uh, Cabot Oil and Gas, 61% year-over-year production increase. EQT, 42% year-over-year. So obviously, they're increasing so much, which is good news, especially when you're lowering the costs. So if you look at the cost side, uh, Cabot Oil and Gas uh, lowered their unit cost by 15%. So they're producing uh, under $3, right about $2.97 per thousand cubic feet, which is great, especially as natural gas prices are now above uh, three or significantly above $3 a lot higher than we saw in the 2012 level, so these companies are doing pretty good. EQT, if you look at their uh, lease operating expenses, they also were down 17%. Their SG&A was down over 30%, so obviously good for them. Um, so what we're seeing, obviously, is more production, lower costs, always good news for the low-cost producers because they're the only ones that can actually produce natural gas at a profit right now. So uh, if you look at some of the common themes that we're seeing, it's really the Marcellus shell that's really picking up. Uh, EQT, their Marcellus production was up over 70%. They had 32 wells uh, that they uh, that they spudded this quarter. So they're really increasing the production in the Marcellus. And that's really turning out to be a low cost play for a lot of people. Cabot Oil and Gas, the same thing. They're seeing that the fourth quarter actually with winter prices coming up and more um, pipeline being installed, that they're looking at the fourth quarter and the Marcellus production to really boost them uh, uh, higher than what they were originally budgeting. So that's obviously good for them. And then Noble, Cor or Noble Energy is another company that uh, really is using the Marcellus they're, uh, and benefiting in that, that way. Uh, this a company that's pretty diversified, but they're looking at the at this past quarter, their, their um, our sales production was up 50% year over year. So they're really, I think the big takeaway here is the Marcellus is really doing great things for a lot of these low-cost natural gas producers. As more pipeline comes online, they're benefiting from it, and you're starting to see that in the first, second, and now really the third quarter has been fantastic. It's interesting to see out of the Marcellus because that's where all the expensive coal is coming from and all the really cheap natural gas. So it's kind of a conundrum that these producers Absolutely. are seeing, which is why Consul was in such a good position to switch to natural gas because it's in that cheap market. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, we've had a lot of earnings so far, but we have more to come. We do. Oh, yeah. We have a lot more to come. So, Taylor. The beginning stages. Right. So, <laughs> what are we seeing with the refiners coming up? Well, Joel touched on a few mid-con refiners and what expectations we have for moving forward with the Brent spread. But in the third quarter, we saw it really tighten. Uh, you saw prices spike over $100 in June, and they continued right on up until now. So you're seeing uh, some, probably some of these margins be crimped here for the mid-con refiners. Kick it off tomorrow. You have uh, Marathon Petroleum releasing, or excuse me, that's on Thursday. Um, seven mid-con refineries for this company, uh, all the way from Texas up to the Great Lakes. So they're one of the bigger companies here in the mid-con. I look for them to have a great quarter um, in comparison to some of their smaller peers like a CVR refining which only has two refineries but I'm focused on here as they had some downtime at one of their bigger refineries of the two so we'll see how they've handled that and if things are coming back to full throughput in the fourth quarter and then Western Refinery operates two refineries out of the southwest, one in El Paso, Texas, and one in New Mexico. So a little bit different geographies here. So you'll get some compare and contrast to see how these different prices are, are helping out or hurting some of these smaller refiners compared to Phillips 66, which releases tomorrow. And investors can kind of get a gauge of the other three that I mentioned from them because they're all across the country. I think they have uh, double-digit refiners, up to 13, I think, all around the country. So if investors really want to needle through their earnings release, they might get a good picture of how the other three are going to turn out. All right, Joel, and then you're going to be keeping an eye on some larger oil companies that are announcing in the next couple days. Yes, absolutely. The first one is Suncor. This is, will be the first quarter since Warren Buffett and Berkshire actually announced they had a position there. Obviously, I really like what they're doing. Uh, Berkshire uh, I really was on top of this company, and I think there's a huge future there. What I'm looking at in this company is they're really focusing on bigger ROI plays. They've invested some of their natural gas assets. What is really uh, unique about this company is 
they have 74% uh, of their production from the oil sands, but by using their mid or their downstream assets in the refining and marketing, they're actually turning 93% of all their oil, even their international uh, and offshore oil, into Brent prices. So they're turning around where there's such a big spread between heavy oil out of the oil sands and even WTI prices. So they're really getting that top dollar for it. I want to see if they continue to get that high dollar if they're marketing and uh, refining margins are still uh, as solid as they have been in the past. So I'm really looking at their downstream to see how that performs mm -hmm. and to see if they're actually hitting their production numbers, which they should be. Uh, the actual uh, EMP side it looks great. Uh, so I'm looking at them, and then I'm also looking at ConocoPhillips they announced on Friday. This is another company that the areas that you want to focus on is are they keeping that 3 to 5% margin growth? Are they keeping that 3 to 5% production growth? They're really focusing on the lower 48 Primarily, they're looking at the Bakken, the Eagle Ford, and the Permian Basin. So I want to look at the production numbers there to make sure they're hitting those numbers. And uh, what that will lead into is more share buybacks uh, and returning um, capital back to shareholders. They have one of the highest uh, dividend in of all, of all independent EMPs. So I want to see if they're ma maintaining those margins to return that money back and really keep growing their business. And the shareholders. Been. Absolutely. Yeah. It's, been, uh, it's been a great year for them so far, so I want to see if they can continue the streak. Indeed. All right. Well, if you're looking for more energy and materials sector coverage, you want to check out our special report, Three Stocks for America's Next Energy Boom. Just send us an email to oilboom at fool.com. You can also follow us on Twitter at TMF Energy. For Taylor and Joel, I'm Allison Southwick. Thanks for watching.